what is the lore of Camelot Unchained? What is the backstory? What's really going on here? Well, if you've seen our trailers, you know that something horrible has happened to this world. There's been not a near extinction event, but an extinction level event. How that all came about and where we are today, well, sit back, it's going to be a story. Hundreds of years before this game begins, the veil was pierced. How it was pierced, why it was pierced, this and many other mysteries will be revealed as players explore the depths and explore other areas of this world. Um, it's not obvious, it's not simple, I think it's pretty interesting, but what players do know is this. When the veil was pierced, the veil storm started. See, the problem here is the veil is alive. The veil isn't some, you know, amorphous uh, barrier between dimensions. It's not a brain. It's not, uh, and by brain, B-R-A-N-E. Uh, it's not this, you know, non-sentient being. It is actually alive. And let me tell you, it wasn't happy about being pierced. And it reacted. It reacted with a vengeance. So the veil storms are part storm, uh, lightning, thunder, bad winds, but that's the easy part. The dangerous part is the magic and the anger of the veil that have fed into these storms. These storms not only can destroy anything they touch, but they also changed whatever they touched. While the veil storms have a physical component, it's the magical component that is so deadly. That magic has the ability to change whatever it touches. Yes, it can destroy, but it also mutates. And with the anger of the veil behind it, this magic had horrific effects on the people it touched. People who were caught out in these storms would literally see their arms changing uh, before them. They would be altered in ways sometimes recognizable, sometimes from their own imagination, and just sometimes into these most horrific of creatures. They were devastating to our world. The aftermath of these storms, even if you survived, you were left to face your family, your friends, who had been turned into these terrible creatures, sometimes while still human and with all those memories of humanity, but with the shape of a, of a monstrosity. Other times their brains would be changed as well, their thoughts, everything. So they became the creatures. There was nothing predictable about these veil storms. So if you've seen zombie movies, imagine zombies on steroids. Not just zombies, but vampires and werewolves and creatures, not only from our imagination, but from the imagination of those beyond the veil. It was an absolute walking nightmare. So our world has been shattered. What's left of humanity hiding in pockets from the storms. Uh, nightmarish creatures again walking the earth. Fortunately, that's when the emissaries came. These were the beings who lived on the other side of the veil. When the veil was pierced, they were affected as well, though not as horrifically as we were. They got here as quickly as they could. When they saw just the absolute devastation, they did their best. They brought stabilizers, they brought their magic to try to not undo what has been done, because that can't happen, but they did manage to stabilize a major part of the world. So they gathered what remained of humanity and then tried to help rebuild our morale. They were on a timetable. See, the problem is, while that veil was open and while power poured into our world, it also poured out of their world. They had to close the veil and get back to their own dimension as quickly as they could. So they had a thought. They knew that humanity couldn't rely on them forever. And while they did leave some of themselves here, some of the beings as well from their world uh, are remaining with us, most of them had to leave. So they designed a test. A test that may be familiar to some, involving swords. In this case, three swords. Three different swords of power, each representing one of the three emissaries. And they put these swords in an anvil. Why? Well, for those who know the Camelot legends and the movies made of Camelot and just stories, it seemed like a good idea at the time. When they put these swords in the anvil, 
they waited for the right people to come and pull them out. For generations, none did. And as usually happens in these stories, right before the clock expires, something good happens. A set of triplets walked up to the anvil, three brothers. Each one was able to draw the sword. When they drew the sword, they went through their own trials. They had to face the veil, aided only by the power in these swords. Each one of them was changed by the veil storms. The changes that the veil storms wrought were not physical at first. The three brothers, they went about the task of rebuilding this continent. Each one of them attracted their own followers. And slowly, the magic in the swords altered them. Not to what they weren't supposed to be, but actually what they were inside. One brother, he had the idea of being like King Arthur. As a matter of fact, he became Arthur. Another one of the brothers, he had always been interested in tales of Vikings. And so, what did he become? He became a Viking Lord. And the third, the third was more tied to nature. He believed in the tales of the she, and so he became one of them. These three brothers, working together, began to reform the world. Unfortunately, differences arose. These three brothers, armed with tremendous power, then began to disagree. Each wanted to save the world. Each had a purpose that was noble and pure, but they were so far apart in how they saw the world. The Vikings, they're all about conquest. They wanted to rush back into the old world, go through the devastation, fight every creature they could fight, and set up new colonies. The TDD, they also wanted to change the world, but they wanted to change it through magic. They wanted to go back to, not necessarily a more primitive state, but to one that was far closer to that found in nature than found in technology. The Arthurians, well, they wanted a, a more regimented society, one where technology would indeed play a more important role. And so over the decades, these brothers fought, and they fought, and they fought some more. And one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, none of these brothers can die. And more so, nobody in the world of Camelot Unchained can die. One of the gifts the emissaries left with their magic was essentially immortality. Everyone who comes into this world, who's brought into the world by natural means, or who's even brought by the power of the veil storms, is essentially immortal. You cannot die. Well, you don't want to say you can't, but you really have to make an effort. And so the idea was that if people are immortal, this small population would very quickly grow and grow and grow because there's no death. And eventually the world could be reconquered and uh, repopulated. Unfortunately, that did not work out so well when the brothers were fighting. As the population pressure grew and their fighting became worse, eventually another war broke out. When this war ended, while the world was not anywhere near as devastated as it was because of the storms. The brothers split, each of them possessing a sword, possessing stabilizers, possessing other artifacts that they rescued uh, from the continent, now decide that they know what's right, and only their way is right. Now look, none of these brothers are evil. None of these realms are evil. Each one believes that they're doing what's in the best interest of not only their realm, but of all the inhabitants of our planet. The Arthurians, they head south. The Vikings head north. And the TDD, they head sort of east, each going back into the changed world and trying to reconquer it for their people. The Arthurians, they had the most success in the beginning. Their area was already flanked by some mountains. Using the power of the sword and the artifacts, Arthur raised the mountains to protect his new city, his new camel, from the Veil Storms. The Vikings, they found what was left of the northern lands. 
being Vikings, they immediately set out in ships looking for other lands. They didn't have a lot of success. They did encounter some dragons. And as we've talked about early on, Sigurd, who's the leader of the Vikings, actually slayed a dragon with the spirit of that dragon. Uh, he was also able to raise mountains to protect the Viking home. The TDDs, they went off into the land and raised an impenetrable forest of very unique trees. Not mountains in the sense uh, that we know them, but sort of like a tree mountain. And they used that to protect their people. Within their own cities, each of these three realms did prosper. Their populations grew. They rebuilt the spirit of generations lost due to the veil storms. Fast forward many decades. Each of these three realms has tried to look for other lands, and they haven't found any that are either habitable or, quite frankly, are even conquerable. They have been changed so much by the veil storms and by uh, every horror that one can imagine. So, with a lot of reluctance, they have all decided to head back to the old continent, to see what is left, to try to conquer uh, it if they have to, which of course they do have to because this is a game. And when I say continent and you're thinking maybe small, no, this continent is big. How big? We're going to be working that out, of course, over the next two years. It is not a contiguous continent either. It has been broken up with the loss of the stabilizers, with the power still of the veil storms. This continent is not one single fabulous piece of property. Uh, it is a very inhospitable place. There is where our game will really unfold. While each city is safe, this continent is not. Each realm has its own motivations. They have their reasons. But it really does boil down to one thing. They must get more space. They must find more resources. They must help to stabilize this continent. Unfortunately, the differences between these three realms right now are insurmountable. They have to go in here and fight. They have to build their cities. They have to expand. They have to make the story for themselves. Each night, you as players are going to be going out and making this story happen. You will be building your homes, you'll be building your forts, your keeps, and even your towns. You'll be going out night after night seeking to get new resources uh, for your people. You'll be fighting against the enemy realms to take their resources, to take their stabilizers, to help make your realm the one that survives. Again, none of these three realms are evil, but each one believes in its heart that it knows the way and the best way to save the world. Which side will you choose? Which realm will you belong to? That will be up to you. What we can promise you here, we will put the tools in your hands. We will give you the ability to make this world your own. How much fun it is, that is going to be up to you. And I hope you'll all join us on this journey. It's going to be a very, very interesting one.